A wise man once said that the only thing certain is death and taxes. And while we can all be certain on the need to fix equality in the United States, we're also certain that it's a complex and centuries-old issue that requires long-term dedication from those who choose to fight for it. But the battlefield does have some immediate benefits, especially in corporate America. From individual citizens to startups to giant corporations, many companies have said that they are stronger when their employees are as diverse as their consumers. So intuitively, hiring diverse talent is a great first step. Every year, most of us go into a frantic frenzy during tax season. Thanks to companies like Intuit, the makers of financial software like TurboTax, QuickBooks, and Mint, we can all pull out a little less hair when dealing with the IRS. With 95% of their revenues coming from the US alone, it's no surprise that they've taken the opportunity to rethink their hiring process and develop a culture that encourages inclusion at every level of the organization, focusing on equity, community, and career development for all the different groups represented in their staff. Creating real systemic change is a continuous journey that requires us to always keep taking steps forward, no matter how big or how small. This is the work in progress. From enhancing their product offerings and customer communication to developing new hiring and retention practices, I had the opportunity to speak to Intuit CEO Cezanne Godarzi and Director of Racial Equity Latoya Haynes about the company's internal and external efforts to close systemic equality gaps. Cezanne Godarzi, my uh, sh matching shirt partner in crime, welcome to the work in progress. <laughs> thank you for having me and thank you for letting me know what you're going to wear this morning so we could match. So look, I'm going to start with a quote of yours. If we begin by working on awareness and acknowledgement, my hope is that we get closer to a world where we value and cherish everyone and stand united in our pursuit of equality, dignity, and justice for all, which is well stated. And you know, a lot of the quotes that I see from you are like, it, it's, it's a true sense of passion for the cause and the issue. Um, where was that passion birthed from in you as an individual? Well, you know, I'll start with, I, I can't suggest that I have been through what uh, many folks have been through where there's uh, racial inequality. But with that said, you know, I was born in Tehran. Uh, I came here at the age of nine in 1978. And six months after I got here, uh, Iran took American hostages. And, um, and it was one of the you know, roughest times of, of my life. You know, I was told to go back to Iran that, uh, you know, I'm harming uh, American citizens, uh, I don't belong here. Uh, and I really got a sense for, you know, what it feels like to be bullied and not wanted. You know, I started skipping school because I just, I hated to go to school to get, you know, picked on. And this is, you know, at the age of nine. So, you know, I, I've used my platform to actually talk about those experiences because I know what it feels like to be excluded, not wanted, treated differently. Uh, and, and I have a lot of empathy for, you know, those that experience it. And, and just last thing on this topic, you know, when I took over this role, and went around the company. Although I've been here for 17 years, and you know, uh, just wanted to tell my whole story to the whole company. Uh, and I was actually rolling out our refresh strategy and the big bets for the company. And frankly, the only thing employees remembered and came up to me uh, afterwards was, "Hey, thank you for telling me your story. Here's what I've experienced." And that's when I realized just the um, just the inequity and the the exclusion that ex uh, exists in our entire community. So. Long answer to your short question, but it's that, that's why it's a personal passion of mine. No, it's, I mean, that, that's incredible. You know, when, when I look at sort of the, the idea of like the financial and the technology industries, especially the intersection of those two things, there is a lot of inequality, as, as we very well know. And so I'm, I'm glad you're, you're rooted in that. Um, what is Intuit doing, you know, to, to kind of close that gap? What are some efforts that you're, you're proud of? Well, you know, a couple of things I would say, uh, we've believed in, you know, diversity and inclusion for years, but we've really learned we've had to up our game in the last couple of years. So uh, less than a year ago, there are a couple of what I would say is significant changes that we made. One is our mission, which is around powering prosperity around the world. The second is our values. Uh, and then the third is what we call our true north goals. Uh, we have a set of goals that we hold myself and the whole company accountable for, and it's around you know, employees, customers, communities, and shareholders. Uh, for our diversity uh, goals, uh, one is woman in tech and the other is um, underrepresented. 
And we set a goal by our fiscal year, 23, we want a goal of 35% of women in technology and 16% underrepresented. Today, we're 28% women in technology and we're about 11% underrepresented. Uh, we set a very high bar uh, for ourselves because by the way, the, the percentages may not seem like a huge increase, but in order to actually achieve them, a large part of our new um, employees that we bring in actually have to be women and underrepresented. So that was one huge goal. The other is inclusion. And we, um, we always measure employee engagement, but now we do a new survey that's uh, around just belonging equity to really understand how our employees are, are doing, feeling, so that we can understand what our baseline is and what we need to do going forward. And uh, last but not least, you know, the show is called The Work in Progress, and that means you know, sometimes we make mistakes, but we keep moving forward. Um, what are some missteps you might have had along the way in this new journey of yours? You know, I would say the biggest one is we really did not understand the experience of our Black employees. You know, we felt very proud of ourselves relative to, you know, we've always talked about increasing uh, the woman in tech uh, as a percentage of, of our workforce. We always spent a lot of time on what are the experiences of women in tech because, you know, many fall out of the, the workforce. And we also had ERG groups focus on other cohorts of our employees. But when some of these racial inequity issues started happening around us and we really dove deep to understand well, what are our black employees experiencing? Uh, we were very transparent in our Q and A's that we are underwhelmed uh, with the focus that we've had. Uh, we're underwhelmed by actually understanding the experiences of, of our employees, which is really what's informed a lot of what I talked about um, earlier. So. I'll, you know, if I had to look back and say one area where I'm constructively dissatisfied at myself uh, and where we are as a company, but now proud of just the focus that we have, that would be one area that I would call out. Suzanne Godarzi, thank you for joining the work in progress. All right. Thanks for having me. Take care. Latoya Haynes, who has an extensive background in human resources and talent management, was recently named into its Director of Racial Equity. She believes that being future-focused and leading with a strong mind and empathetic heart are key to combating institutional racism in the workplace. Latoya Haynes, welcome to The Work in Progress. Thank you so much, Chris, for having me. I appreciate it. You're five years in, roughly speaking, at, um, at Intuit, but you have this newly created role. Um, tell me about that and, and, and about the shift to that role. Absolutely, yes. So in August of 2020, I became the first uh, Director of Racial Equity and in into its company history. Uh, this is a great role. So for me, I kind of think about the role being put in essentially three buckets of work. The first part of my role is I have the pleasure of serving as the driver for our racial equity advancement leadership team. We call it the real team. It's an all black employee team. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that. And then the second part of my role is really focused on creating our racial equity strategy uh, for the company and um, to really think about how we create programs and initiatives uh, for not only employees, but also for communities and for our customers. And then the final of the three parts of my role, I really call it kind of the lanyap bucket. It's got a little bit of everything, but it's really about accountability and amplifying those programs and initiatives so that we have this multi-year journey with impact over time. How you empower that everyday individual to go like, oh, I see an issue or a problem or an opportunity and, and I need to take action. So we're doing a couple of things. First, we've done a refresh of our values. So in our values, we have this new value called Stronger Together that really focuses on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we also have a value that's called courage, right? We want people to say something, right? When they see an inequity or they have a concern, we want them to not only, you know, make it known, but we want everyone else to be involved in implementing a solution. Right. So those are two ways that you see it in our values. It's also in our strategy. You also see diversity, equity and inclusion language in all of our initiatives, whether those are business and customer facing, but also through things that we're doing for communities as well. Interestingly enough, language to me is like such a moving target. Right. You know, Martin Luther King was Negro, like every speech. How do you keep track of that? And how do you keep people educated and updated and, and also just mindful, I guess, about the, about the language? 
Yeah, so there's a couple of great things that we're doing from the standpoint of language for keeping up. The first thing is we've enrolled some racial equity experts to help us on the journey, right? The second thing that we've done is really focused on the fact that we're going to make mistakes and how do you recover, right? So we use this, I use this football analogy amongst the team, like every fumble has to be recovered. So there is an expectation that we will make mistakes when it comes to language. The other component of our kind of language strategy is to ask people to self-identify, right? Do not assume that someone is gay or straight or do not assume their race or ethnicity ask the question and, the, and then begin, you know, the discussion based on how they identify themselves. There's been this great evolution, if you will, on whether or not Black people want to be Black or African American or, you know, 9,000 other terms. So do not uh, classify people, but allow them to self-identify on their own. And then the final thing, and you may have heard some of this from Sasan, we've really made a big investment in an anti-racism language guide, and it's actually available it's public so anyone can see it but we've actually removed words that cause harm like white glove service and blacklist or master admin so to date we've been able to eliminate about 800 instances of those words being in our training manuals our products our marketing materials and branding materials so we're really trying to make sure that people understand not only is diversity equity and inclusion something that we're focused on right now but but again, it's a part of our DNA and we will work to make sure we're able to eliminate it wherever it exists in our ecosystem. Speaking of which, is an excellent time to talk about, you've been you know, in the talent and human resources space for a while now, it's some, it's some pretty top organizations. What did you have to unlearn in this new role and uh, to be successful? Uh, there's a couple of things I've had to unlearn. I think the first thing that I had to unlearn is that diversity, equity, and inclusion um, is for everyone, right? It's not just for underrepresented and marginalized employees. Um, and I think just having, you know, I, I'm a bicentennial baby, I'm a 70s kid, and growing up over the past 30 years, just acknowledging the shifts, not only in the world, but in the corporate landscape. So that was the first thing, just unlearning some of those unconscious biases and things that I've been taught in the past on how you approach people or how you identify people. Um, the other thing for me that's been an amazing learning is leaning into millennials and early career professionals and just how they think about diversity. It's very different. It's a part of the mainstream for them. When I was growing up, there was only a handful of Black people on TV. Now you have more than a handful, right? So also making those adjustments and thinking about how that impacts corporations. I had a pivotal moment in my career where um, I, I was having a bad experience. And so my decision for myself was to leave this company. And I actually had someone to reach out to me and say, hey, the role that you're looking for is inside the company and you need to go and apply for it. And I was like, no, I'm out. Right. And so I actually went and had a um, quick conversation with the hiring manager only because my manager forced me to do it. She's like, look, this is your role. Go get it. Right. And I didn't want to burn any bridges between her and the hiring manager. So I went to go and talk to this guy. So I looked him up online and no lie, he looked like Captain Kangaroo. And I was like, he does not know anything about being a black woman. This is not going to go well. But I went ahead and had the conversation and he asked me how I would approach the work. And I was giving him my answer and he looked up from his paper and taking his notes and he looked at me in the face and said, are you answering that as a black woman? And I said, absolutely, there is no other way for me to answer this question. And he said, you can have the role. It's yours if you want it. And I was like, Captain Kangaroo? Like what? He actually became a major ally and advocate and coach and sponsor to me. And so one of the things that I learned in that moment is we bring our own unconscious biases to every experience that we have. And you never know what allyship actually looks like. You never stop learning. Again, thank you. Toya Haynes, appreciate you. Thanks. 
I think one of the most interesting things for me was really learning from Cezanne's personal story. Being an immigrant from Tehran and, and like knowing what it's like, I think empathy plays such a big part in combating inequities in business. And so, you know, being able to, to do that from the top down and really have a level of depth of understanding of what it's like to go through some of these things is super important and it plays out really well in Intuit's strategies. I think Latoya's role as the racial equity director inside Intuit is super, super interesting. And the fact that she's able to focus and hone in on one group, currently the, the black employees and their experiences can then be rolled out as learnings to other marginalized groups inside of the organization. And that is just a super interesting way to pilot a program, roll it out, test and learn, and continue to do that over and over until a higher level of success is reached inside of the organization for all the goals that they have when it comes to diversity and inclusion.